The, the, the two largest um, concentrations uh, of uh, individuals of the AYA range are in the military and in the university uh, system. You heard uh, about the university system, and now we're going to hear from uh, James Hu, who is a medical oncologist here at USC and uh, is the medical director of the sarcoma program here, and he's also the lead uh, oncology liaison uh, at Los Angeles County. Uh, Dr. Hu has been in the military really since completing his undergraduate uh, education here at USC uh, and um, has been on our faculty since uh, 2009. In fact, just recently he retired after 30 years of uh, service uh, in the Army. So he, he brings a, a unique um, insight from uh, 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 AYA in, in the military and also now in his um, position as a, a, dr a director of the sarcoma effort here. So James, thanks for being with us today. Okay. Thanks, Debu. Um, so my name is James Hu, and I'm uh, the medical director of the sarcoma program. I'm an adult oncologist, and um, uh, I deal primarily with sarcoma and testicular cancer. Uh, my background is a little unique in that uh, I spent a lot of time in the military, as you can see, and uh, very uh, not very often do I get to show off my master's in military history and my master's in strategic studies uh, on my presentation slide. So anyway, thank you very much. I also want to say to the Stroud family, uh, I was here for that inspiring story of, of his life. And I can tell you one thing, I think he'd been a great, he'd, he would have been a great soldier uh, in the Army. So thank you very much. Um, anyway, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I just want to say, uh, a few things about the military. Uh, it, yes, I think we need to define who they are. A lot of what we talk about, excuse me, this, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is, is based upon some of the studies that the military has done in their population. And uh, this is generally that population. This is a, uh, a picture from Japan. This was the last mission that we went on uh, about, uh, about a year ago. And uh, basically, uh, these young men and women are expected to do big things. For example, put up combat support hospitals in foreign places uh, from the ground up. And all of these, all these soldiers are either healthcare providers, they're uh, nurses, um, or their medics, and, and basically these guys have to put up the structure itself um, with the help of a few doctors uh, in, in foreign places. So uh, that's me right here. This is uh, General Potter. That would be me from, from MASH, and, uh, and this is our group. Okay, so, uh, so I try to view uh, the military uh, population through an AYA lens, and so uh, the AYA, so just to, just to tell you, there is no AYA program in the military. All of our patients are AYA, as I'll show you here in a second. Uh, there are differences in culture, um, and, uh, and I think the, the biggest difference, we talked a little bit about insurance coverage. Uh, every single one of our soldiers are insured, okay? And, um, and uh, all of them have a job, so they have an income coming in. Uh, fertility, whenever I see a, a cancer patient, I uh, discussed fertility issues with them uh, when I was in the military active duty, and, uh, the, and TRICARE does cover uh, fertility preservation uh, in uh, those afflicted with cancer that might be getting chemotherapy, for example. And finally, uh, psychosocial issues. That's a big, that's a big deal in the military. Uh, it's not been specifically studied in the cancer population, but at least in the, uh, in the uh, military population in general, uh, it's been well studied. And I'll, I'll present a little bit of uh, data uh, on that. Uh, so this is generally what a military oncologist would see in this population. Now, uh, this was a study done uh, from Zhu et al. from Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. And uh, they looked at uh, the ACTOR database, which is the active duty uh, tumor registry, okay, which also includes a lot of the dependents as well. But from the 20 to 59-year-old age range, what you can see is there's a, a, a large number of testicular cancer patients as noted here. You see that? Um, and second, uh, now keep in mind this study, they actually excluded lymphoma and leukemia patients and Hodgkin's patients. Um, 
But as far as solid tumors goes, uh, prostate cancer was 17%, which is really unusual in, in this population, uh, followed by uh, colorectal and breast cancer, uh, cervical cancer. Um, and also you can see that, as expected, the gender distribution is uh, highly tilted to the, to the male population, to the male gender. So how does this compare with the SEER database? How does this compare to the, the civilian uh, population? Well, uh, age-adjusted uh, incidence rates, you can see that the prostate cancer, prostate cancer, oh, excuse me, let's go to previous, uh, prostate cancer and breast cancer seem to have a higher age-adjusted incidence in the military compared to the civilian population. Conversely, uh, the lung cancer population appears to have a slightly lower uh, incidence in the military population compared to the civilian population. And, uh, and you can see that colorectal just in uh, white males, uh, there's a lower incidence uh, compared to the civilian population. And finally, cervical cancer in the African American population is actually lower in the military compared to the, uh, the civilian population. So the question is why? And, 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 you know, the military is very, very interested in this because a, a lot of our, our women in uniform uh, actually are, uh, are employed in the motor pool. They're exposed to solvents and fuels and things like that. So uh, this was actually one study that was done uh, looking at occupational exposures and observed expected ratios compared to a cohort of active duty women between 1980 and 1996. And you can see that in this group here, in the 17 to 24 uh, uh, age group, there was a higher risk of, uh, in those breast cancer patients, there was a higher chance that they were exposed, okay, to, uh, to volatile organic compounds. So at least in this group, you can see that on this case control study, that there was a higher chance that those patients with breast cancer were exposed to a high level of volatile, volatile organic compounds. Very interesting study. Uh, obviously, you can't really make connections with this. You can't, uh, you know, attribute cause to this. But it's certainly an interesting finding in this study. Um, in addition to the breast cancer population, uh, the uh, this was a study done in 2,300 women from 1998 to 2000. And what you can see here is that the uh, uh, that there is there are some disparities in terms of race and presentation. Uh, in stage in cancer patients in, uh, with breast cancer. And, uh, and, and as you can see, the African American population tended to present with more advanced breast cancers compared to, I'm trying to get this mouse to work, uh, compared to the Caucasian population here. Regional is basically lymph node positive disease compared to uh, just uh, lymph node negative disease, which is the local. And also there was a higher amount of estrogen receptor negative and pro uh, progesterone receptor negative patients uh, in the African American population compared to the white population as well. But what I found really, really interesting was this, that despite the fact that there was a higher, uh, um, that the African American women presented with more advanced cancers, uh, they were less likely to get uh, systemic uh, chemotherapy uh, in that population. So that got me thinking, well, why is that? Um, so uh, just in conclusion with the breast cancer population, I can say that occupational exposures are very important in the AYA population, and the Army is very interested in finding out if this is ex indeed a cause. And, um, and then why there's disparity in treatment with therapy between races is, is very, very unusual. So, um, but I thought I could get a little bit of insight into the decision-making process um, with, uh, uh, with the uh, patient-doctor uh, uh, treatment decision uh, process um, by looking at testicular cancer. And just by way of, uh, I just want to, for those in the audience that uh, don't know how testicular cancer is treated or, um, or staged, stage one basically involves testic the testicle alone. Stage two uh, means that the testicle cancer spreads to the lymph nodes in the, in the back of the abdomen. Uh, stage three is uh, cancer that's above the uh, diaphragm. Um, and so this is really one of the few cancers that is actually uh, staged with just three stages. 
But uh, this is an ultrasound uh, of a, uh, a right testicle that shows uh, evidence of uh, cancer. And so what I tried to do was look at uh, whether there's any differences in treatment based upon, well, in the military compared to the civilian population. And so what I did was I looked at stage one disease. So stage one, uh, just to clarify, stage one uh, testicular cancer, there's three options to treat. One is uh, do an orchiectomy or, or remove the testicle. And, uh, and follow with CT scans and physical exam and tumor markers. Uh, or you can get surgery where they go in and they actually take out the lymph nodes and the retroperitoneum. Uh, or uh, you can get two cycles of chemotherapy. And I can tell you that here at USC, uh, the vast minority get surgery. They, they want surgery. Most of them want surveillance or chemotherapy. And so uh, uh, this is a study done just down the road here in San Diego at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. And they looked at stage one cancer patients. And basically, uh, uh, in that population that they looked at over 10 years, uh, they, um, uh, they appeared to be uh, similar in, in their presentation, both in their, both in their frequency for seminoma, uh, as well as the, the incidence of stage one cancers presenting with stage one. So really no difference between the civilian population and the military. But what was interesting was that there was a higher number of patients with stage one uh, cancer that opted for treatment in the military. And what's amazing is a higher amount of patients will actually get surgery uh, rather than any sort of surveillance or chemotherapy. So the question is why? Why is that? Well, I think all you need to do is look at this uh, AR-40-501. AR-40-501 is a document uh, that basically informs physicians or oncologists in the military about uh, uh, who can be retained and who needs to be discharged. And, uh, and so you probably can't read that, but basically those patients that are diagnosed with cancer, if they're returned back to their unit, um, they cannot deploy, they can't go overseas unless uh, uh, unless they, uh, their monitoring is more than six months. So that sort of rules out surveillance for a lot of these patients, okay? Because in, in germ cell stage one, uh, surveillance, as you'll see, is almost every two to three months with CT scans. And there's no CAT scans out there in, in the dirt or in the, in the sandbox out there in Afghanistan, okay? Uh, secondly, they may not opt for chemotherapy because uh, in, in uh, AR 40-501, paragraph 4-5, you can see that blood and bone-forming uh, tissue diseases, any amount of anemia will exclude you from ever flying, okay? And just as an anecdote, um, uh, I had a patient, I used to work at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. and. Uh, for advanced disease, typically we treat these patients with a drug called bleomycin. Bleomycin is very uh, a lung toxic, a pulmonary toxic. Uh, at least the side effects uh, are there in a small, uh, small percentage of patients. So uh, I remember I had this uh, uh, young active duty Navy sailor who came in and uh, he wanted to dive. And one of the exclusions for diving was getting bleomycin. So it did affect his career. So what happened was we opted to give him a, a, a treatment that was more toxic to the bone marrow, but less toxic to the lung. And so he actually got a, a combination called VIP uh, chemotherapy for four cycles. So as you can see, uh, in the military, it's a unique population. They're very concerned about their occupations. And, um, and I'm sure in the AYA population extrapolating, uh, they're very concerned as well uh, with their occupations and their futures, their future occupations as well. Uh, just, uh, I just cut and pasted this uh, NCCN guideline. Just wanted to show you uh, those folks with uh, stage one disease that got surveillance, that uh, these are guidelines to follow patients uh, that had an orchiectomy and, and choose surveillance. You can see that CT scans are done every three to four months for the first year, every four to six months the second year, and every six to 12 months the third year. So that pretty much excludes deployment for a lot of these soldiers and sailors and Marines and airmen. Uh, but if you look at the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection only, you can see that the requirement for CAT scan is just basically as needed. So as a result, a lot of those patients 
uh, in the Navy have chosen retroperitoneal lymphoid dissection. And so occupation does matter in the military. And uh, just, uh, just to show you, the, uh, uh, the outcomes for germ cell tumors at, at the Navy were uh, just as good at, or better than the uh, seer population. Uh, so there. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, these, are these, are AY these are some of the AYA patients that we might see. Uh, these are th uh, three uh, individuals from my unit. The, the one on the right is a junior enlisted uh, person, and the two other ones are senior enlisted folks. Uh, they're uh, staff sergeants, and this is a specialist uh, or corporal. Okay, so after saying all that, so right, now, so we know that there are differences in incidence in the uh, in the military. We also know that there's certain factors, like occupational factors, that may influence how we treat these patients. What about survivorship? And uh, this is it. this is interesting. This is a Steed study done out of the NIH, and basically what they did was they followed uh, these patients for 14 years, these testicular cancer patients, and what they found was uh, those patients that. Well, actually, what they measured was physical, the physical component school, uh, score and the mental component score. And what they found was that uh, overall, uh, those patients that got chemotherapy did worse, okay? But especially that group of patients that uh, got chemotherapy and had non seminomatous germ cell tumors had problems with social functioning later on compared to a control. Um, and also had uh, poorer physical component scores as well. So whether they influence each other, it's not clear. But clearly, uh, that's a subgroup that is high risk in long-term fo follow-up for survivorship. So, um, so that gets me to survivorship and mental health as well. And uh, in the AYA uh, uh, population, or in the, in the military population as well, uh, as we just heard, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of psychosocial issues with this group of patients. And although there's no cancer-specific studies done, we certainly have a lot of data in our soldiers that are, uh, that are deployed and exposed to stressful situations. But let me just show you, here's a picture of a lieutenant. Uh, so he's a junior officer, generally uh, college-educated. Um, uh, this is a, a female junior officer, uh, Lieutenant Garrett, in our unit. Uh, they have needs, they got to eat, and oftentimes ravenously, okay? And this is a picture from, uh, these are our cooks. So uh, basically our 325th cash, we, when we deploy, we cook for ourselves, we do everything on our own. And uh, we're just basically a self-sustaining organization. Uh, they got to play, okay? So this is in Japan, these are sumo wrestlers uh, fighting each other. And of course, as uh, most of them are, our soldiers say, they got to chill too. So. Uh, they like to relax, and you know, I was just thinking in the in the previous lecture uh, whether our soldiers are different in terms of their high risk behaviors, and I will say that coming into the military they are, but the uh, but the army is very very uh, attuned to some of the motor vehicle accident risks, alcohol abuse, suicide, so they get a lot of education and training on um, on what to look for in terms of symptoms from their compadres, from their uh, fellow soldiers. So we're watching out for each other, and that might be a little bit different culturally uh, compared to the civilian population. Okay, so what can we conclude so far about so psychosocial aspects of the military? First of all, it hasn't been well studied in the cancer po in the non uh, in the cancer population, but it has been studied in the non-cancer population. Uh, the support structure is slightly different in that the commanders and actually the people that uh, uh, that the soldiers work with. Uh, they're actually very, uh, very attuned to any uh, aberrant behavior and, and help that they might need. Um, what the military also identified was that in order to develop, to build, uh, I heard the word resiliency, in order to, to build resiliency in the soldiers who might be faced with a lot of stress and, of deployment, uh, they decided that uh, it's probably important to educate the soldiers and not 
uh, provide them therapy. And the reason for that is, is they don't want to stigmatize these soldiers that come in here or sailors that come in there and, and, uh, and stigmatize them as being somehow weak or something like that. I'm sure that's something that the AYA population uh, can identify with. Uh, and, and so what they said was, uh, so what the military decided was uh, they would put uh, trainers or educators with each one of the uh, line units to educate them about resiliency. Okay, and I'll describe a program that we just, uh, we have some data on. And uh, the four uh, pillars of resiliency that they've identified was spiritual, emotional, family, and social. Uh, and so they would train these soldiers uh, these educating soldiers, what we call master resiliency trainers, uh, in these four uh, areas. So what I wanted to introduce was this, uh, this program called the Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Program, because I think we can take a lot of lessons away from this, this program. And so what this is is a resiliency-based uh, uh, program in which uh, those four areas that we just talked about, uh, they would uh, Actually, the Army put about $30 million into this project. And uh, what they did was they took senior enlisted, they took them over to Pennsylvania, where the University of Penn developed this, uh, this resiliency program, and trained each one of them uh, in 80 hours worth of resiliency training so that they can educate uh, their fellow soldiers about resiliency. And so, um, so I just wanted to make a correlation with the stress of deployment with cancer. And um, as you know, deployments are very hard on families as well as, as the soldier themselves. And uh, I actually took this slide and modified it a little bit. This came right out of the resiliency handbook that the Army uses for this comprehensive uh, soldier fitness program. But the six realities of deployments are, they're often dangerous, but cancers are often dangerous as well. Deployments are often harsh and demanding, and we know that cancers can be harsh and demanding as well. Deployments are very hard on military families. Cancers are very hard on military families and any families, AYA families. Deployments do affect behavioral health, as does cancer in the long term. But finally, uh, cancers and deployments can actually provide a chance for soldiers and AYA population to actually get better, to grow from their experience as well. So that's, that was the impetus to uh, develop this resiliency program for, uh, for the military. So the report came out in uh, 2012. The conclusions of the report, uh, it's called report number three from the, from the, uh, from the training program. And what they actually did was they took MRT Master Resiliency Trainers, put them in four uh, units, four brigades, um, and, uh, and analyzed their resilience, uh, using a resiliency tool, their outcome compared to their scores compared to a group that didn't get the MRT training. And what they found was, well, it wasn't a great study. Uh, they found that the groups were not very well balanced. For example, one group was, one uh, group of brigades was actually deployed. The other group was back in the States um, getting ready to deploy. Uh, there was a large dropout rate. You know, once the uh, soldiers come back from their deployments, they actually, they go to the four winds. And uh, a lot of times they get out, they, they're injured, they're put on medical leave, and sometimes you just lose them. There's about a 20%, 30% dropout rate in the study. Uh, however, of those that they were able to measure, resiliency and emotional health did improve. Um, but it wasn't clear because of the confounders whether the uh, MRT was actually the reason, the Master Resiliency Trainer was actually the reason for uh, this improvement or this difference uh, based on the confounding variables that I just identified. And finally, uh, just because uh, they, they use resiliency as a marker, it's called the GATT tool, but it's not clear that this GATT tool that they use, Global Assessment Tool, actually correlates with uh, depression, PTSD, and anxiety. So these are some of the, the, the problems with this study. Um, so I think some of the lessons that we can learn from this, from the Army Resiliency Study, was that MRT is a nice concept to educate about resiliency. 
to educate about resiliency. Uh, using master resiliency trainers uh, instead of healthcare providers or healthcare workers might offer a tool to screen out potentially high risk patients without the risk of stigmatization of that group of cancer patients, for example. And future better design and controlled studies are needed uh, with the military to, to prove that some of this resiliency MRT uh, training actually works. So in conclusion, uh, with the AYA and the military, the military prov uh, provider sees a lot of, uh, a, lot of a higher number of AYA-like diseases. Um, AYA in the military is a special population. Uh, some of the decisions, especially occupation and future, is very, very important uh, for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and, and Marines. And finally, psychosocial interventions are needed and require further study in the cancer population. So, um, so this is a picture from uh, Japan. This is the end of our exercise. And uh, on the right here is General Rosinski. He is a three-star general who is the land component commander in the Pacific. And that's me. That's yours truly. And we're talking about strategy. And um, so where do we go from here? Is there a way that we can actually partner with the military to actually generate some data and some information? Well. I just described a lot of the, uh, the issues here on the, on the left, left hand side uh, uh, of the environment of the military uh, population. And uh, I, I, I can say that CNS, thyroid, melanoma, leukemia, lymphoma is still not very well studied in the uh, military population. But on the right, these are some of the problems that might get in the way of doing studies involving military, the military population. And um, the actor database is actually an active uh, duty and uh, dependent database that the military has been keeping since 1986. It's a huge database, and a lot of important information is in there. There's a lot of inherent cultural differences between academia and the military, which I won't get into. But uh, you know, the the um, uh, the military is very focused on taking care of their soldiers immediately. Uh, there, there's a lot of turnover in the military. Um, whereas in academia, it's relatively stable, very, uh, you know, um, very science oriented. Uh, and uh, obviously, the military can't always be science oriented because of uh, the necessities of, of uh, deployments and, and things like that. And finally, clinical studies aimed at the AOA population are not always feasible just because of that turnover. You know, gone are the days when I first came in in 1983 into the military where doctors could stay actually at places for 25, 30 years. So uh, now everybody's deploying, going every which way and getting out of the military. So um, uh, clinical studies aimed at the AYA population may not always be feasible. There are clinical trials in the military, and, there, uh, uh, and each one of the military centers actually is affiliated with CLGB or the South Plus Oncology Group. So what are some of the solutions? Uh, well, I think it's important to just focus on what our interests are. This is Charles de Gaulle. Time's up. OK, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, basically, what I think we need to do is begin a dialogue with the Army Medical Department to explore some of these areas that we can uh, get some data on, especially in their unique population, focus on smaller studies, and also work through the individual cooperative groups uh, through uh, Southwest Oncology Group in the West and the CLGB on the East. OK, that concludes my talk.